Okay, welcome back everyone, welcome back to the channel. If like me, you're a keen mountain biker as well, your YouTube feed this evening will probably be littered with the new SRAM Eagle release, coinciding nicely with the start of the Type A bike show. I don't know if they're trying to overshadow that. I'm gonna look at the hardware. I'm gonna look at the architecture of the rear mech. There's obviously chains, cassettes, crank sets involved here as well, but I think they've made a bit of a clangor with the rear mech getting rid of the derailleur hanger. Mechanically, I just think it's an absolute turd. I think they've tried to reinvent the wheel a step too far. Now they're claiming that the shifting performance has greatly improved. You can shift under full power. That's great. They've got a narrow wide kind of chainring thing now going on on the rear cassette, which surely means that the rear cassette now needs to have an even number of teeth on all the cogs, which I don't think anyone's mentioned. But anyway, aside from that, Let's look at why I think the derailleur is a bit of a boob because you've got all the usual shield channels just pumping it, saying it's the next best thing since sliced bread, but I completely disagree. So this is an overview of one of the new rear mechs. There's a couple in, in the range. There's an SL1 for kind of cross country, and then you've got some enduro slash downhill. Well, not downhill because no one climbs a downhill bike, but enduro and trail bike versions. And they've done away with the derailleur hanger. That's the first big thing. Now, People are gonna people are gonna say, "Oh, you're a grumpy old man, grumpy old man, typical engineer." Um, why would you replace the derailleur hanger? And yeah, like why would you replace the derailleur hanger? It's a sacrificial component, but it also offers a lot more benefits. If you've ever ridden a mountain bike in any serious anger, you'll know that the rear mech does take impacts. It gets hit by you know rocks. It, the cages are very long because they need to go around 51, 52 tooth cassettes or whatever. They do get impacts. And the sacrificial component there is a good thing to have. And they've done away with that. But it's not just about that, which, which, which is what is pissing me off. You are shifting your reliable datum for index shifting. First of all, let, before we get into it, let's just have a look at what the, the differences are between this new mech and the mechs that have been around for 20, 30 years before this, which used derailleur hangers. So I've stolen this picture from Bike Radar. Thank you very much. I'll put you a... Uh, credit in the in the caption but but fair use policy applies this is the new one on the left it's got a, what i call a clevis clamp arrangement and and all the other mechs in the world are like this one they bolt to a sacrificial thin aluminium plate called a derailleur hanger now the derailleur hanger is exceedingly important not just to break when your mech takes an impact so it doesn't damage the expensive carbon frame which pretty much at the dropout is not repairable it provides a what I call a datum interface for your shifting indexing. So you know that when you take the wheel out of the bike and put the wheel back in, or you take the mech off the bike, if you're going traveling, you put the mech in a bike box, you know that when you put those two components back together, your shifting index won't change because the mech hanger doesn't move. And it's a reliable datum interface provided that it's straight and it doesn't get bent. Now on the left, we've got this clevis kind of clamp um, approach with these two plates that I've just marked here. Now there's a fixed gap between those two clevis plates and the dropout, the frame member, carbon or aluminium, goes in between the two. Now to, to be able to assemble that, there has to be some assembly clearance between the clevis plates which are fixed on the rear mech. One isn't sliding or compliant, they're both fixed plates, part of a forging or machining. They have assembly clearance on the dropout, right? Now there's also kind of what I call a little stub axle which goes through here to pinch the assembly together or to kind of set the location of the assembly and there's a bushing which the whole thing spins on. First of all that bushing can wear but I'm not too bothered about that because a rear mech is full of bushings and pins because obviously it's a parallelogram type design. To take up that clearance you're actually going to lose some of your axle clamping load. Like I said there'll be an assembly clearance on the, the clevis kind of clamp and it will be loose on the frame until you pinch it up with the bolt and then it's tight but you're losing some of that bolt load on the clamping just to close the two leaves of the clevis. That's fine if your dropout is a very, very snug fit. As soon as you start doing the bolt up, you'll start to clamp down on the frame. If your frame is slightly looser, and we know because of bike industry tolerances that it's all turd in the bike industry, if your frame is slightly looser, you need a lot of bolt load just to take the, the slop out of that clevis kind of clamp arrangement. Unless I'm mistaken, there's no wedges, you can't space that gap anywhere. You just need to do the bolt up tight so it does close that gap. That's what I don't like. We don't have that problem on a normal mech because it's single plate type design. You just do the bolt up and as soon as you apply any sort of bolt torque, you get clamping to the rear mech hanger. And there's just another quick picture here of the, the arrangement of the clevis clamp. So this plate and this plate are all one part of machining, whether it's forged or machined or forged and machined there, that is a unified body which slides up over 
the dropout and clamps together. So you need to take out that clamping clearance with the bolt load. Now you might, let's say you've got 400 kilos of 500 kilos of axial tension in the bolt, it might require 200 of that to take out that clearance. All frames are gonna be different. Some frames are gonna be thinner, some frames are gonna be fatter. Let's just remind ourselves the bike industry that we're dealing with. This is Pink Bike when they went to one of the pivot factories. So if I decided to start a bike brand and come here, would I have to do? This is a factory in Taiwan, one of the better ones. That's an employee sleeping on the floor. Anyone seen one of these before? Anyone works in a bike shop? This is probably one of the most handy tools we've got in a bike shop. And this goes back to being bike industry QC turd. This saves the day. This is a derailleur hanger alignment tool. Now, as we know, bike frames, dropouts, are not always perfectly parallel to each other and they're not always perfectly straight. So setting the mech hanger alignment is crucial. Now, with the new type, we can't do that. There is no adjustment on this mech for angular or parallelism. You are set by the carbon frame, the rear triangle of the frame or aluminium frame, whatever it is. We know that when you heat treat a TIG welded aluminium frame, it does go out of alignment. So that shifts then more QC pressure onto the factory to make sure everything's aligned. That comes back to wheel installation. To put the wheel in the bike, you need clearance. So let's say your dropout spacing on a mountain bike is 148 nominal. Out of the factory, it's probably about 149, 150 because you need a quite a little quite a lot of clearance to be able to get the wheel in nicely without a lot of force. Then what happens to the, so the dropouts start there. When you clamp them up, they come in a bit, but they don't come in parallel. They, they, they do that, right? So how the, you know, this is putting more QC pressure and more tolerance pressure on the, the manufacturer in the far east to get this right. In carbon, in aluminium, you, you, can, you can get around that. You can bend the dropouts afterwards. In carbon, you can't. You're stuck with it. After you demold the, the rear triangle, if it's out of line, you're fucked. It's out of line. Um, and then you're, all you're shifting with this type of mech hanger design or lack of mech hanger design is going to be out. These two parallel plates, this part of this clevis clamp arrangement can't be bent. That's the whole premise. It cannot be bent. So we've lost the adjustment, it's a backward step. Um, we're gonna have more QC rejects, we're gonna have more frames with lousy shifting on this, I guarantee it. Another thing, impacts. Now, SRAM have basically just declared that the first law of thermodynamics doesn't exist, and they're saying that because the mech doesn't bend or break, it's strong enough and everything's fine. How naive an engineering approach is that? Just because it doesn't break, everything's fine. I'd rather the mech hanger break than that shock load be passed through to the carbon layup of my frame, which I can't see if it's broken. I can't see if it's breaking my linkage bearings. Like this is a this is a SRAM picture from one of their press releases, and I think I've got this off bike rumor, credit to you. This is a full suspension bike, which we quite often see a pivot at the rear axle. So this is a chain stay seat stay pivot, uh, quite common on a four bar linkage. SRAM think this is okay to pass you know, hundreds of kilos of shock loading into bearing races. I would much rather take that on a mech hanger and snap the mech hanger and save the linkage bearings in the frame. So let's just take a little look at this and see what a successful test looks like in SRAM's language. Tough. Real tough. Oh yeah. So that's passed, has it? Passing you know, all of that energy into the frame, into the carbon layup, into the linkage bearings. Don't forget your chainstay length is probably about 450 mil. So you're passing a couple of hundred kilos of force times half a meter, creating all that torque on the linkage bearings, the shock bushings further up. What damage is that doing to the carbon layup? What damage is that doing to the free hub bearings, pitting the bearing races? I mean, that if that's not naive as a past test, I don't know what is. That's that's quite shocking, to be honest. Now let's just look at this little exploded diagram of one of the rear mechs. And um, this is going back to what I talk about having a shifting interface or a datum in interface for your index shifting. Now this component here scares me. This is a serrated tooth washer, and this goes against the carbon dropout. Not so bad if you've got an aluminium frame, but many mountain bikes and the people who have these kind of expensive mountain bikes that are gonna buy a rear mech for $650 will be clamping it to a carbon dropout. And a serrated dropout. Serrated dropout, like a knurled end cap, does eat the dropout over time. Every time you release the axle load, you clamp it up, you release it, you clamp it up. If the wheel's coming in and out, going in and out the car, 
traveling with it or just on and off for punctures or maintenance, every time you clamp it, that serrated washer will change its location on the frame because it does fret and dig into the soft carbon. Now, at first I thought maybe that washer isn't facing the carbon, maybe that's facing the other um, kind of metal interface of the, of the clevis pin type arrangement, but no. As you can see here, if you look really closely, that serration is facing the soft carbon drop out of the frame. And that is just an absolute clanger. Um, if that shifts also, if that gets twisted in torsion, that's just going to eat the soft carbon. Um, but even if it doesn't, every time you apply axle clamping load of maybe what, uh, an M12 at 15 newton meters, you're probably looking at about 600 kilograms every time you put the wheel in out of the bike that those teeth and that serrated washer are just going to eat into that carbon dropout and once that changes your shifting datum moves so your gears aren't going to be indexed anymore not to mention the fact that if this dropout isn't perfectly um look at my drawings pat like perpendicular yeah like just like that to the axle this um could not be you know you just can't you can't align it if the, if the carbon frame isn't perfect out of the mould, you can't align it, you're always going to get crap shifting. I just think this is a step backwards. What they've done on the cassette with the shifting, shifting under load, I think that's quite cool. There are other things on the mech that I really like, like this jockey wheel has kind of like a weird sprag clutch in it, um, or a slipping clutch if you overload it. So if a stick or something goes through that, it will still turn, uh, because there's a sort of like a sprag clutch bearing interface between the outer ring and the inner wheel. There's one way you could get around that and just fill the holes in. Just fill those holes in solid and then nothing could go in between it. Surely that's a more simple solution, a lighter solution. More cost effective solution. I think that's just marketing. Um, as you can see here, when you get the bike in and out of the frame, this twist, that's fine. As long as that serrated washer doesn't move, that's fine. Because there's the little nib of the serrated washer there. That's fine. Um, but like I said, the frame's width, if that's sloppy, if a frame comes out slightly too narrow, the, the mech's always going to be sloppy. There's a, another bushing. Obviously, mechs are full of kind of pins and bushings, uh, dowel pins, to, so everything rotates. One there, one there, one there, one there, one there. But there's a massive one here now, um, and that goes on there. And that's kind of the, the axle for the mech to rotate about. That's going to wear. There's no, there's, there's no getting around that. That's going to wear. It's in the path of water, debris. There's no weather seal on here. I don't think there's any lip seal, o-ring, or anything. That soft bushing interface, normally they're sort of a, a polymer, um, and that looks like aluminium, that will wear quite quickly, and then you're going to get angular slot, radial slot. But I think they've created a, t a solution to a problem that didn't really exist. And the price is 650 USD just for the rear mech. I just can't see the need for it. And the extra problems in literally manufacturing QC and, and the frame interface it's going to create is don't like it's, it's just not going to work. If, if SRAM controlled bike production um, or controlled one supplier of all bikes, they can nail this. But the reality of the bike industry QC and manufacturing is that it's not capable to, to, to nail this. Like I said before, we can align this mech hanger if it's out of shape. If this dropout isn't perfectly perpendicular to the axle, and it's not perfectly parallel to the other one, we can align this mech hanger to get perfect shifting. We can't do that with this. So if this dropout face here is not perfectly perpendicular to the axle, this mech will never shift properly. And there's nothing we can do to change that because these plates are seriously stiff and they're joined. They cannot be bent, really, because we've seen the marketing shots of people standing on them. And they've done. They've stiffened the whole mech up so they can do the shifting on the load thing. Because don't forget, when the chain, the top, the top, the top side of the chain, if that's under you know a thousand watts in a low gear, you can get a couple of hundred kilos or a couple of kilonewtons of load in this chain and be able to shift it under load. Let's say you've got you know uh, running on the angle to the to the large cog at the back. You may have a hundred kilos or some certainly tens of kilos of side load on the chain. Um, trying to prevent it from shifting. So this does need to be stiff because with this design, the single mech hanger, if there's any side load on the chain, it's not very stiff and the mech can move. A very quick production. I hope you followed that and leave any comments you got down below. But cheers and I'll see you next one.